the plan acting in its role as the committee for citizen involvement. Could we have a roll call, please? This is the work session for the planning commission. We're not in um, citizen committee for citizen involvement as we talked last night. Is that okay? I apologize. I no, didn't. no worries. Commissioner Landon. Present. Commissioner Bergen. Here. Commissioner Salazar. Present. Commissioner Coivula. Here. Absent is uh, Commissioner Gill and Commissioner McGinley. Thank you. As we begin our meeting tonight, I would like to ask members of the audience who are joining us by phone or online to please keep yourselves on mute during this portion of the meeting. This meeting is a work session where the public may attend but not provide testimony. Later during the work session, there will be time for public comments for the Planning Commission. And by my thing just flipped out on me. Uh, we have a work session item, the development code update from uh, Mark Rust. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you. I'm Mark Rust, senior planner with the city of Springfield. And um, I'll just maybe turn it over to the assistant city attorney, Christina Kraz, for a moment to ask for the uh, potential conflict of interest statements. Thanks, Mark. So as a reminder to the Planning Commission, this is um, a project which will affect development standards for all properties in the city, uh, or almost all properties in the city. And so um, if you have a potential conflict of interest, you have to declare it at the beginning of the item. A potential conflict of interest is something that could affect either you or a relative's economic interest or that of a business of you or your relative. And so, for example, if you are a residential property owner within the city, then your participation in this work session could impact your financial interest um, related to the value of your residential property. At this time, the Planning Commission only provides recommendations to the city council for, for final adoption. And so you cannot have an actual conflict of interest on this legislative matter. So um, you, there's no need to recuse from participation, but you just need to declare if you have any potential conflicts in the nature of that conflict. I do, I have a potential conflict of uh, interest in that I own a home and property in Springfield. Commissioner Corvula? Same. Commissioner Salzar? I have a potential conflict of interest in that I'm a property owner in Springfield and I also work for Cornerstone Community Housing, an affordable housing developer um, who develops in Springfield. Okay, Commissioner Bergen? Potential conflict of interest being a uh, residential property owner in Springfield as well as a practicing real estate broker, primarily in Springfield. Thank you. Great, so if that's all right, I'll go ahead and jump into the presentation. We do have um, quite a bit of material in the packet tonight. I don't necessarily anticipate that we'll get through all of the material tonight. There's again, quite a bit. And the idea is that these work sessions over the summertime will kind of be a rolling work session and we'll see how much material we get through in tonight's work session. And then the subsequent work session will schedule to kind of pick up where we left off tonight. Um, I did wanna provide enough material that we had plenty to talk about. And if we do move through it quickly, then the more we can get through the better. Um, these are not deliberations tonight. These the uh, hope with these work session is to just familiarize the planning commissioners with all this draft material. 
we are just today and tomorrow releasing the materials to the broader community for the community engagement phases and seeking input. We did update the project webpage. I know our communication staff was still just working on, and I was still working on tonight, um, just before this meeting, um, sending a e-update. It's our electronic kind of newsletter related to the project to the list of interested parties for the project. If that doesn't go out tonight, still it will go out tomorrow. But um, so that's kind of announcing the formal launch of the broader community engagement. So all these draft code sections are the draft code sections that are being released to the public for public input over the next two months. They're um, including two phases of the project. Phase one is related to housing. You've heard quite a bit about that. And then phase two of the project, the larger development code update project is the employment lands phase related to commercial and industrial zone lands in the city. So I'm intentionally starting with the sections that are in the packet tonight that are more related to phase two, the commercial and industrial lands. However, some of the sections are applicable more broadly. And as an example, just this site plan review section that I'll start with, that's the first attachment in the packet tonight is applicable to housing in addition to commercial industrial development in that it would apply to say like a true multifamily housing development, like an apartment complex. Additionally, the later on in the packet, the procedures code section attachment four is also the procedures of how we process all applications in the city. It's not specific to commercial industrial. It is in phase two of the um, larger project, but I just wanna make clear it's a applicable more broadly than that. So um, we are asking the planning commission for input or um, you know questions. It's not that necessarily the input and um, comments will be incorporated at this point into the process. It will be considered together with all of the community input that we receive over the next couple of months. And then we will be forming a public hearings draft ultimately that will come to the planning commission first in a formal public hearing process that will kick off in the fall. And that at that point is when the more official um, process with the planning commission where you will hear from the community and then take testimony and then offer your own specific recommendations to make a formal recommendation to the planning or to the city council. Um, so those ultimate public hearings draft will build off of a lot of the information I hear from you and from the public. And it'll be kind of a balancing act to try and develop those public hearing drafts in a way that incorporates a lot of the input we hear. There will still be um, opportunity to make changes through the public hearings process stage. So to jump right into it now, I'm gonna share my screen. And again, I um, am going to start with the site plan review section. Make sure I get the right screen share here. Is that, do you, can I get a head nod or a thumbs up? That's the site plan review section. Yeah, great. Um, so, and if there's questions, Along the way, I'm happy to entertain them. I don't have a kind of a formal presentation as part of this necessarily. Um, I intend to be more of a conversation and again, see how far we get through this and um, work through it as we go here. So this is the draft that was in the packet. I have saved it as a different working draft. So I plan to make notes in the document as we go tonight and capture comments or questions. Um, I did receive some comments and questions from Commissioner Cravula earlier today by email. I haven't had a chance to review all those yet, but um, Commissioner Cravula, you mentioned that you could bring those up and that's fine as we get to those items tonight as well. And so I have intentionally also left some of these dialogue boxes open in these documents. These are what I kind of refer to as working drafts or 80% drafts, meaning that they're not intended to be finalized. These comment boxes won't 
be on the public review drafts necessarily, but I am highlighting these for the Planning Commission to point out areas that we're still contemplating as staff, at least areas that still need work or, um, you know, there's potential options for how it's addressed or applied and still specific areas seeking input on. So with that, um, this section, you know, the other tricky part about writing all brand new code is it's not in a track changes format where we can compare it easily to the existing code. We've gone over a number of times in different work sessions, the purpose and the um, objectives of the larger code update project. It's to make it the code easier to use, more clear. The original intent behind the code update project was to keep it policy neutral. And with related to housing, with the adoption of House Bill 2001 by the state for middle housing, that's been incorporated into the housing codes of the section um, that we'll review later, we haven't had the ability necessarily to remain completely policy neutral. And when I say policy neutral, I'm referring specifically to our comprehensive plan policies, the overriding planning document that regulates the planning for city of Springfield, and then the zoning code, this development code is what implements those comprehensive plan policies. So we'll be dealing with some of the inconsistency required by House Bill 2001 for middle housing um, through the adoption process. But these other sections primarily are intended to remain comprehensive plan policy neutral and really just updating them for clarity and ease of use, consistency and, and cleanup. So another factor that plays into it, not so much with the site plan review, but other elements of the code is to create what we call clear and objective standards for a lot of development. So the state law, pre-existing state law also requires us to have clear and objective approval standards for housing. And so this note over here on the side um, talks about this clear and objective process and it mentions needed housing. Needed housing is defined in state law. Um, for simplicity terms, we can think essentially that needed housing applies to all housing in the city of Springfield. Um, there's a few really kind of outlier instances where there's some types of housing that don't qualify as needed housing, but for all intents and purposes, needed housing includes all housing. And so because, as I mentioned a little bit ago, the site plan review section does also apply to multi-unit housing, which is kind of like an apartment complex type development. The site plan review standards section also has to contemplate a clear and objective approval path. We could have an alternative path that is discretionary. It doesn't mean all housing has to be approvable through clear and objective standards, just that there has to be a clear and objective approval path for housing. And then additionally for commercial, industrial, or other types of development other than housing, we don't have to have the clear and objective approval path as well. So with compared to the existing code, this site plan review section is a significantly more kind of condensed and cleaned up. A lot of that was an opportunity to refine. I'm gonna scroll down here pretty quickly here to jump to a different section, but it's, it's the approval standards themselves. A lot of this stuff I'm scrolling past, I can get back to, but um, has to do with submittal standards. But these approval standards here are what I would consider the, the bulk or the probably the core of what the site plan review section is dealing with. And so these are the approval standards for a site plan review. It talks about um, discretionary uses, which depending on what zone and what use we're talking about, may or may not require discretionary use permit to allow the use in a certain zone. And then in addition to that, in that case, 
they would also still go through the site plan review process. So this is kind of right here, these sections, 4.2, 4.3, 4.4. Really the consolidation of a lot of these standards and in this section referring to these other sections, even though it, it creates a little more back and forth between jumping from one section to another, it creates a lot more internal consistency with the code. So if we wanna modify a landscaping standard, say we don't have to modify it in multiple places, we can modify that landscaping standard in one place. Um, and then it's from here, you go to that one standard. The existing code structure is a lot more complicated and there's multiple landscape standards and multiple different sections that they all don't necessarily um, say the same thing. So it makes it confusing and a little bit hard to implement depending on the situation. But we'll see a similar thing later on as we get into the some of the other code sections, maybe even tonight with the minimum development standards. But I wanted to point out, so these the, are essentially the approval standards for a site plan review. And this is greatly simplified from what's existing today. And we are deferring then to these other sections for the standards for all these different types of standards. So even though this is the list of approval standards, we still have to incorporate these specific standards from these other sections into the decision to make sure for each of these kind of categories of standards, they're also met. That can also create the dynamic of what I was referring to about clear and objective standards. So that would also mean that these standards that um, these different sections are being referred to here also would have to be clear and objective standards. And that's not always really easy to do, especially I'll point to the infrastructure standards for utilities and transportation. Those are probably some of the most difficult sections to get to the point where for housing at least, that we're being able to be approved through a clear and objective process. So with that said, I'm gonna scroll back up, um, talk a little bit about the site plan review section from the beginning. And, and this is basically what's required to be submitted for a site plan review application. Um, there's quite a bit of detail here in some of this. This talks about when a site plan review process is required and um, some of the applicability standards. The other thing related similarly to the um, approval criteria, these submittal standards, the attempt has also been made to consolidate these. You can see a reference here to a different section of the code. There's other code sections that have also dealt with submittal standards. It, it does get kind of complicated depending on what kind of application we're talking about. Again, I'm gonna to refer to the MDS or minimum development standard section that's attachment two in your packet tonight. That we kind of talk about generally as like a mini site plan review. It doesn't necessarily involve or require the same level of detail as this full-blown site plan review. So the submittal standards, for instance, for an MDS application are somewhat reduced from what these submittal standards are. So to the extent that we are trying to standardize the application submittal standards and what's required to be submitted, there is some variation depending on what type of application we're talking about. So, but you can see the different types of information we're asking for here. There's some general information section. Um, there's an existing conditions plan that we ask for and all the standards related to that. Then the proposed site plan itself. So this would also encompass a vacant site as well as an existing developed site where they may be expanding a use or adding buildings or modifying a site. Then a, a plan or the improvements shown on a plan that are related to the utilities. And so lots of detail, uh, a landscape plan and um, all the things, again, citing all the different sections of code related to siting and screening, um, plantings, 
those types of areas. And again, there in the existing code, there's the way it's written, there's some confusion between what's a submittal standard and what's an approval standard. And those are two very different things. Um, so even though these submittal standards, I'm gonna just use this landscape plan section as an example, we're talking about the screening as specified in this other section. So that screening section may say um, what's required to be shown. It also may involve the approval standards for you know, how we approve the screening. So it, it creates a little bit almost of a gray area, but we're trying to make it a lot more clear with this new, um, the way the new code set up compared to the existing in that definitely specifying the difference between what's required to be shown on the plans to be submitted versus what we're gonna be reviewing those plans based on for actually the approval standard. And I, Chair, if you wanna call on Commissioner Bergen or if you're happy if I just call on people as they raise their hands, I'm either way. I'll just I'll just go ahead and call on Commissioner Bergen if you want have a question. Just real quick, and this might not be the right time for it, and um, it's just sort of a logistical question. Seeing how there's actually quite a few areas that reference another section in the develop in the code, right. um, and in the digital platform that we're in, do you know from feedback that I've heard from community members, um, not on the just in general speaking, in general sense, um, when they're looking at the code and having to reference over to other num to other areas, is are the other areas going to be hyperlinked where they can click it and it opens up a new tab? Again, it's a very logistical question. But anyway, will they click on if they click on that number, it opens a new tab, so they're not having to back arrow back into the section um, to make it a little bit more streamlined in that process as well. Yeah, Commissioner Bergen, that's a great question. And you're right, it's a little more of the, I would phrase it as, as part of the implementation process, part of the code on how we, you know, like you mentioned, everything's a lot more digital now. So we do have our existing code hosted online and the intent is this one will be as well. Um, we are exploring different providers for that digital hosting ones that could provide slightly different or better functionality with the online hosting of the code. And we have also heard those concerns of, that you're mentioning about the ease of use of that online code. And so the, the idea is, or the intent is to do what you mentioned, and that is to definitely have the code sections hyperlinked. Um, the idea of whether, you know, this code section is hyperlinked and you click on it and it opens it in a new window versus just jumps from this page to the new page within the same window. Sometimes is a functionality of a browser potentially. I mean, I can right click on a hyperlink and choose to have it open in a new window versus that being set as a default. And I don't know the technical specifications on that exactly to answer your question, but we definitely want the ease of use to um, be better than it is on the existing code today and are, are exploring those options. Awesome, thank you. Sorry, it's such a tangent. It just was something that I wanted to make sure was heard before I forgot <laughs> about that. So thank you for hearing that. Yeah, no problem. I'm happy to entertain the questions. And um, we have, our the city council has definitely expressed those interest and concern with the ease of use online. And so we're very, aware and um, working on those issues as well. It's, um, what do I wanna say? The council has um, expressed concern even with this, you know, referring to other sections. And so, you know, we could, it, it gets, it's, it's a balancing act in terms of do we build, do we repeat the same I'm gonna just point to this standard seven street trees. Do we have that standard, the street tree standards in this section? Do we repeat that street tree standard in multiple different areas like the site plan review section and 
the MDS section um, over and over. So everything's all contained in one area for each different type of application or um, which would result in the code being much longer and repetitive. And then again, like I mentioned earlier, if we change say a street tree standard, then we have to potentially change it in you know, four or five, half a dozen different places to make sure it's consistent. Verse is just referring to the same section from everywhere. So it's just one standard contained in one place. Um, so again, there's trade-offs to the structure and how we've built this. We've um, landed on and are recommending this structure to where it does just refer to other sections with the idea that the ease of use will be incorporated to facilitate that going back and forth. So it will seem more seamless and not be so cumbersome to jump back and forth between different sections. So it, it's a good question. It's it plays into a lot of how these standards were written and contemplated. But again, to, I think build the consistency and clarity that seemed like the better option to how to pursue it. Thank you. Yeah. Again, so um, these are all still the submittal standards. This, co this section, the site plan review section isn't really that long of a section. It's. I, I don't know the page count for the existing site plan review section. I'm sure it's quite a bit longer than nine pages. So this has been um, reduced fairly significantly, but a lot of that again is because we've taken these approval standards and just referred to other sections. Um, and so again, those these different sections would have to be incorporated. And then kind of the end of the process when you go through a site plan review process is we typically will approve a site plan with conditions. So the conditions might be, well, you, you showed five trees, but really there need to be six. And so on the final site plan, make sure and show the six needed trees or, you know, there's all kinds of different things that could become conditions of approval. But um, then they submit a final site plan and that's kind of the um, the document that's relied on for what was actually final approved. So I'm happy to walk through any of these comments that are included here. As you can see, where there's areas for um, deciding things still, um, how we define terms. I did include the definition section in the packet tonight. It's attachment three. I'll just mention on this definition section, that includes all the existing defined terms in the code today, as well as any that are being proposed to be added new definitions. And we're not, that draft doesn't really delineate what's new or versus what's existing. We've also proposed, I think, to delete some definitions and it's not always clear. So again, it's, it's really difficult when writing a brand new code to do any kind of a track changes version. Um, the definition section is probably one that could most easily be created in a track changes kind of format. But um, again, we're just trying to provide clean versions of new code sections starting from scratch um, for the most part. So with that, I think, I think we can parse this out by section. I'm happy to talk about the site plan review section or if there's no comments or questions I'm, or we can, um, go over some additional sections. I'm happy to elaborate um, and go through some of these questions or um, take comments now if commissioners have them. Well, I'm not seeing any. And, um, I don't want to put Commissioner Cravial on the spot. He, I mentioned he did um, provide some comments and questions. I'm happy to highlight a couple of those that are applicable to this section, if that's OK. Um, no, that would be fine, Mark. OK, let's do that. So his comments refer to, let's see if I can find, the, the PDF pages. Um, and I'm wondering if I have the PDF section open. 
Um, I'm not sure I do. One of his first comments or questions talks about the, some of this language right here. And again, this is under the kind of the site plan process and applicability section. And again, I haven't gone through all of these, so I don't want to get them incorrect, but um, there's a, I think a comment or a question asking about that when we specify these distances, so 50 feet located within 50 feet of a property line, or also referring to the 150 feet top of bank, you know, the question is, does that include or exclude right of way of streets? So I would refer, sometimes we can refer to the definition section. Here specifically, we, we mention here as measured from the property line and the subject property, how definitions are measured or distances are measured is, um, would include the right of way. So if, um, as noted in here, 50 feet, within 50 feet of a property line, if a right of way for the street is say a 60 foot wide right of way, then the, um, the property across the street would be over 50 feet away. This specifically refers to um, located within 50 feet of a property in a residential land use district. So it is referring to a, a, a property. So sometimes the language reads um, 50 feet from a residential land use district which would be the zone boundary itself versus a property boundary. Here we're referring to a property boundary. And so the 50 feet would include the width of a, a right of way, I think is the question. Hopefully that answers it. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, there's an additional question. And again, there's, you know, the. From my perspective, again, I, I refer to these as 80% drafts, and the idea is to try and make these as clear as possible. So the more sets of eyes on these, I'm really, you know, using the planning commission for almost editors or somebody else, you know, all of your sets of eyes on things and having different views and takes on reading this. So if you read something and it's not clear and there's like I if I have to explain what this means um, to this one, how we measure this 50 foot, it, it may be to me an opportunity to write it in a way that's more clear so it doesn't have to be explained every time. So again, I'm not going to be offended if you pick apart the language um, and I'm happy to write changes in ultimately or make note of recommended changes at least that could be incorporated into the ultimate public hearings draft so the language is more clear. And again, that's what we're hoping to get from the general public as well with our community engagement is get peppered with questions and um, comments and so we can make this language as clear as possible. The less interpretation or explanation we have to do of the code language, the the more clear the language can be on its face, the better. So that's our intent. So um, we want to try and achieve that. So I think the next question was about the size of property. And you're asking here in acres or square feet, this language here, I think the question refers to, and it's um, you're recommending that it's it could be better worded to say acres and square feet instead of the or. So maybe, and that's an opportunity to provide more clarity that a plan would show the area in both acres and square feet. And I think the idea is um, to be more accurate. You know, the example in the question is 0.18 or 0 0.01 acres um, would be 436 square feet. So acreage may not always um, be um, calculated out to a decimal level that uh, gives enough specificity is what I'm anticipating the questions about. So this or could be changed to an and. And I'll, I'll be able to go through Commissioner Quavula's comments and questions and 
highlight them in this draft to be able to note them for um, contemplation for the public hearings draft. Actually, actually, Mark, um, uh -huh. I'll, weigh, I'll weigh in and say that, you know, some of the ones that are just common uh, questions that can be answered uh, really quickly are, uh, to me, are pretty secondary, because I think that you'll probably uh, look at the document and um, determine those. But there's, you know, I have some other comments, um, some of them regarding like, uh, um, where we were talking about fencing being in lieu of plantings. Mm -hmm. okay. And to me, that's that's more of a, a more important um, concept where we're talking about stuff like that. Um, okay. As opposed to, you know, some of these ones that are um, uh, just additions or suggestions. Okay. Yeah, and I know your first kind of um, highlighted comment that I that you're referring to the fencing is in the next section of code under the minimum development standards section. And I'm happy to jump into that. Uh, um, and, and we can always revisit these sections. I'm, again, I'm wanting to introduce them to you and familiar, start to familiarize you with them. So as you're um, tracking public comments that we're discussing in future work sessions over the summer, or you know, hearing things in the community or talking to colleagues, um, you're at least starting to be aware of what's all in here. The other thing I'll mention is as we get to future sections and we start looking at some of these other sections that are referred to, or even more specifically in the approval criteria section, when we start looking at these are the development standard sections, we can understand that when we look at section um, 4.4 on landscaping, we're understanding that that section is being referred to from the site plan review section as the approval standards for a site plan review process. So happy to always revisit that and make those connections. So I think if, unless there's other questions or comments at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and jump to the minimum development standards section and we can go through that. And then um, again, one of Commissioner Cravula's comments, more substantial comments has to do with some of the language in in that section so we can address that as we get to it correct and uh, thank you and um also anyone else who has questions feel free to jump in at any time i, I don't want to control the narrative so this is the minimum development standard section <clears throat> it's uh, the next section in your packet attachment two i don't have the pdf page numbers um at I could get them if, if needed, but hopefully everybody's tracking. If there's questions, let me know and we can get everybody on the right page. But um, so I do, we do, ref, I refer to this as kind of a mini site plan review. So the applicability section here is, I think, revised and clarified quite a bit from what's existing today. The idea is to establish parameters for when this MDS process can be used versus when it's required that a site plan review process has to be used. And I think I just actually see a typo. Oh no, so we're talking, so there was some contemplation about there being two types of MDS processes and there's a minor process and in our existing code today, we have two. There's a minor and a major. I'm, I'm thinking that these actually might be typos, which is unfortunate um, because I think we, we went back and forth. And again, to recap quickly, I've explained some of the process up to this point before, but I've been working with technical advisory committees on these code sections. So there was a, a member or a, a technical advisory comprised of community members. Um, there were two, I had a technical advisory committee on the housing phase, and then a second separate technical advisory committee um, of community members for the employment lands phase. So all these code sections have been developed and reviewed in draft form with those technical advisory committees, as well as um, internal um, staff technical input on how the code sections have developed and been um, proposed. 
And so again, we both with the technical advisory committee and internal staff, we we're trying to weigh the pros and cons of having to keeping the two step minimum development standards process, both minor and major versus combining them into one. The intent was to combine them into one. So when I'm saying there's typos, I think referring here to a minor process and the fact that this says there's two types, I think that's an error, I think. And, and in scrolling down, I don't see the second type in here. There's really only the one because otherwise this would be the minor section and then number two would be the major section. So again, I think that's an error that will have to be corrected. Um, so again, the intent though is to have one MDS process. And these are kind of the parameters for which somebody could qualify to use the MDS process. And then if they exceed these standards, then it would kick them into a more um, thorough site plan review process, kind of the full blown site plan review process. The idea is that this is a more simplified streamlined process. I'll mention two here, and we may or may not get into this tonight in attachment four is the procedure sections. So all of our applications have an application type, and this is based on state law. There's different um, procedures required under state law for different application types. And just generally, and if I misspeak, I, I think um, the assistant city attorney, Christina Kraz is on here. She tracks all this and has helped me very um, thoroughly on the procedure section that we'll ultimately get to. But I may speak in general terms and not get all the precise language correct. But in general, under state law, if something is considered a land use decision, it basically means that there is discretion used in making that decision. So the site plan review section that we just went through does use discretion and isn't, well, and again, I mentioned the clear and objective standards for housing. So it has the opportunity to be both discretionary or for housing clear and objective. And so, but a site plan review process has a requirement to be, a, or it goes through the process of a type two application. So there's four types, we, we call them type one, type two, type three, and type four. And again, we'll get it, these are all spelled out in detail in the procedures code section. A type one is the simplest type of application and type four is the most difficult. I would say the majority of applications we process are either type one or type two, probably type two being the, the majority. And type two is where it truly becomes a land use decision, meaning there's some discretion in, in approving that application. So if you we're trying to ever mitigate impacts through weighing the pros and cons of how the site is developed or the type of use, that's going on a site. Um, anything where we have to use discretion to weigh the impacts or anything like that, that's the city using discretion to determine how and if that is approved and putting conditions on it, then that's a land use decision under state law, which requires notice to all the surrounding property owners, in, as well as um, even though we mail notice to just the surrounding property owners, anybody can actually comment. And so we, there's a comment period and then we you know, incorporate comments into the making the decision. And then there's an appeal period after the decision is made. And if somebody that's impacted by the decision wants to appeal, then there's an appeal process. So that's your typical kind of a subdivision is typically a site plan or a type two application most like commercial and industrial developments that go through a site plan review process are type two where there's discretion used. Um, in contrast to that, a type one does not fall under the realm of a land use decision by state law because 
a type one is intended to be purely clear and objective. And when I think about clear and objective, um, I typically think of the approval standards or the um, criteria for approval that we're weighing a type one decision on are basically like yes or no questions. It's um, do they meet the standard, yes or no? There's no discretion really that has to be used to say, well, they could meet the standard if you know they provided a landscape buffer. It's like, or it's or even for landscape standards, um, if the standard is plant one um, tree for every five parking spaces, you can count the trees, yes or no. They have enough. They have one per five parking spaces, or they don't. It's not a criteria that says plant a sufficient number of trees to mitigate um, or buffer the parking from adjacent land uses. That would be very discretionary. It's like, well, what does sufficient mean in terms of buffering and mitigating the impacts from the parking to surrounding property? So um, it's a quantifiable, clear and objective standard that a type one process establishes where if everything's truly clear and objective, then no, um, it could qualify for a type one and then no public notice is given. So the minimum development standards process is intended and written to be a true clear and objective process and a type one application where um, you know, no notice is given to surrounding property owners and there's no appeal period. It's just yes or no, you meet all these standards and therefore you're either approved or not. And if you're approved, then you go get your building permit to build it. In contrast, again, like I said, the site plan review, then if you can't qualify for a minimum development standards, it gets elevated to the site plan review, which then is a, a bit more intensive of a process, kick it into kind of the type two discretionary review process with more intense standards. And I see Commissioner Cravula's hand and um, one other, which I'm not necessarily. Oh, go ahead, Commissioner Salazar. Go ahead, Commissioner Salazar. You're still on mute. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Cuevo, and thanks, Mark. Um, I'm wondering, um, I found it really helpful, the um, just I'm thinking of, of how to translate the what you're talking about to the layperson or person who might want to get into development. And um, I know that the, the code change table was a great example of, of um, a document that may be supplemental but is easier to read. Um, it's a, yeah, just a, some, is that uh, this yeah, one? That, okay. that one that I'm talking about, yeah. Um, a, as a supplement to, to um, these sections that we're talking about. I'm wondering if it's possible, if you think it's possible to make some, especially when you're talking about applicability and um, the, le the differing levels of review someone might have to go through um, if it's a um, minimum development standards or the site plan review, if it gets elevated to that level. Do you think it's possible to make some sort of flow chart that a developer could see like, oh, if it, if it um, meets these standards, it's in the minimum development standards level of review, or if it doesn't, it has to be elevated to the, to the site plan review. Um, do you think that's possible to make some sort of, of a flow chart in that way? Or is it too many layer, do you think it might be too many layers of um, possibilities that it might be a multiple page flow chart that might actually not be that helpful? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Thank you for it, uh, Commissioner Salazar. And I think um, the short answer is yes, I do. I think it's possible. The, the caveat is kind of what you just mentioned is how complicated would it be? But I think there's ways to simplify it, not have it really be too official and have it be kind of more um, a general illustrative guide. And, and that there could be multiple flow charts and one might be like you said, for site plan versus MDS or another good one I think that could apply or maybe be parallel with that would be 
like you talked about um, or asked about is the different types, like type one versus type two, type three, type four, and just kind of spell out in general some of the parameters. I think if we, and it would just be kind of a user aid. I, I actually think, I think they're quite antiquated at this point, but I believe we do exist, have existing some flow charts at the city now is that maybe were used in the past as handouts for members of the public. Um, there may be some that were kind of internal, but I think they, there are some that were probably existing or pre-existing. Um, but I, I wrote that down. I think that could be a good thing to incorporate into these community engagement materials is a more illustrative um, way of trying to demonstrate some of these differences. I think that's a good suggestion. So, a lot, and, and then the other part of that is just prioritizing the time to do that work and how much time it would take to create. I'm happy to add that to my to-do list and um, see what we can come up with. Yeah, thank you. I definitely don't want to add more, more to your plate, but <laughs> I think it might be helpful to uh, to the public for especially for this public engagement process. Yeah, no, that's it's great feedback because again, I, you know, we we get entrenched in this stuff, and like you said, explaining some of this complicated material to the lay people um, and just the general public in the community is important, and we want them to understand it. So, and there's. I, I tend to be more of a visual learner. It's like you put a bunch of words on a page versus showing it in a kind of more of a diagram form. Different people are gonna receive the same message in different ways. So I think that's beneficial for sure. Commissioner Quavila, did you have? Uh, yeah, it's just basically a comment regarding uh, MDS. Um, years ago, we uh, did the uh, Development Advisory Committee, and we landed on the two-stage uh, MDS, and it was a uh, it was a difficult it was a difficult process that we managed to uh, do that bifurcation at that time, and to see that go away, I think would be a will be a real boon to the development uh, community to see the uh, MDS minor and major go away, and uh, just kudos on the work and trying to merge those two into. Uh, a working thing that I think will really improve uh, the uh, relations and uh, really make things a lot easier. Thanks. Oh, great. So, and just so I understand your comment, you think that's a good thing to merge them? Is that what you were saying? Absolutely. Okay, good. Yeah, well, thank you for that. It, it's, it was a difficult process for sure. And as you can attest to, you know, trying to weigh all the pros and cons. Um, you know, one of the things that stood out, I think from and I think, again, Christina Kraz helped with this, but identifying some of the reasoning behind, behind the two steps was, it was interesting because the way the existing MDS is written and having two tiers is that there were two different sets of submittal standards, but when it boiled right down to it, the approval standards were both the same. So whether it was a type one or, or I should say a minor MDS versus a major MDS, you had to submit. And, and really, I think, you know, in, it was geared towards more of a mom and pop time, you know, a one time thing where they wanted to add a small addition maybe to something um, it, that maybe wasn't like a sophisticated developer that did it all the time. So we didn't want to require what I, referred to as kind of the mom and pop one-time developer to have to do all this really in-depth development of technical plans and all this stuff. But um, from a, I think from a legal perspective, there wasn't really any justification if they were meeting the same approval requirements standards, why we would have different submittal requirements. So anyway, when it, in combining the existing minor and major MDS, really what we have done, and to be kind of clear and honest about it is, we've elevated the bar to require everybody to do kind of more, not or to, do, to meet the higher submittal standards. So it's kind of gotten rid of the minor MDS that allowed um, kind of a reduced set of submittal standards 
that might be easier for like, again, I fondly refer to kind of the mom and pop developer um, to, to do, meaning they might not have to hire a professional architect or designer or somebody to help them develop the plans. It was something more attainable that they might be able to, you know, create themselves. But so in combining the two sets of standards, it's kind of set the bar where really the MDS major is set today, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And, and Christina, maybe you want to chime in on that. Yeah, I do want to let the commission know that there are state standards for what types of professionals can do what kind of landscape or site planning work. And so even if the city allowed, you know, would accept a submittal that was done by a mom and pop, you know, type store owner doesn't mean that there wasn't a state law that already required a professional to do that work. And so in some cases, we're not really raising a bar, we're just reflecting a bar that already existed um, for, for some of this type of work that has to be done by a professional. Yeah, great clarification. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, and, and Christine is referring to these, so the, here's within the MDS is kind of these submittal standards of, you know, when a certain licensed professional is required. So um, that's what this reflects. Um, let's see what else. The, the one thing I did wanna kind of touch on here is again, the triggers. So this number, so the, and again, let's ignore minor in here. And, but for when an MDS can be used, the trigger talks about new construction, could be a vacant site, um, doesn't exceed 50,000 square feet. So that's, that's a pretty big development. That is the existing threshold. We didn't change that threshold. That's the existing threshold in our existing code for a major MDS. Um, we did clarify some of the language. The existing language isn't 100% clear on when it's an addition or expansion or different changes of uses and things like that. So this is really, A is really geared towards new construction. Then B is really con um, concerned with an addition or expansion. So we tried to break those out and make it clear when one is different than the other. The threshold's the same, the 50,000 square feet. So you could, in theory, you could have an existing, say 50,000 square foot building and be adding 50, an additional new 50,000 square feet, doubling the size of it and still qualify for this MDS um, based on just the, the size standard there. Um, and again, some additional um, provisions here. The one I think is important too is this, it's a change in land use category or building occupancy. Our existing code is definitely not clear on um, change of use always. The one thing I'll say too, as we get more into the actual zoning district sections themselves, so when we start looking at the commercial zone section and the industrial zone section, we've greatly simplified the use tables themselves. So for instance, in the commercial zones, the existing code lists a very detailed list of different types of commercial uses. So, and I'm making these up kind of off the top of my head just for um, illustrative example, but we might list the bookstore and candy store and hardware store and a bike shop or, you know, all these different types of retail uses, where in the new code, we're not getting that detailed. We're basically creating categories of uses where the category is retail sales of goods and services or something like that. And again, we'll get to it eventually. I don't have it in front of me, but so in our current code, if somebody wants to change a use from say a bookstore selling books to selling, and I'm using kind of a silly, simple example, but changing selling books to selling candy, let's say, well, kind of a hard line view of that could be, well, you're changing the use, you're changing it from selling books to candy. And because we list those two different uses separately, that's a change of use. When in really, it's just a retail use to retail use. So it, it um, 
under the new code, the idea is that wouldn't be a change of use. So, um, and why that matters is if there's an existing developed property with a commercial building on it that maybe was built a long time ago, doesn't necessarily meet all our existing standards. And some of the big ones that we look for in MDS review are bike parking always typically comes up. Um, not all old commercial uses were developed with bicycle parking. So when there is truly a change of use, we make them add bike parking to the extent we can to come up more in compliance with the existing standards. The other one often is landscape standards. So a pre-existing developed site that is changing use, we look for opportunities to improve the landscaping to meet our current landscaping standards. That's not always 100% possible. And when we get down into the approval standards a little bit lower, I'll point some of that out. Um, but we try and bring it more into compliance. And there's kind of a, an equity gauge in here a little bit. Again, we're, we don't use discretion. So the criteria have to be written in a way that um, allows for it to be clear and objective, but um, it may not be possible to have a five foot landscape buffer around the entire site if that's what's required under, a, if it were a brand new development, but because it's a pre-existing development and there's site constraints, um, it may not be possible. So we look at, we consider that through the MDS process. Um, so anyway, talking about this D here, the change of land use category is not as many um, changes will trigger an MDS if it's say retail to retail or an eating and drinking establishment from a restaurant to a bar or something like that. Hopefully I'm making that clear. Um, the other one is this mentions building occupancy. That's kind of a different threshold altogether. There could be cases where under building code, the occupancy type changes. So maybe, um, I, I'm not sure I'll come up with a good example off the top of my head, but it may be that based on, I don't know, the number of people that they're going to have within a building increases significantly. And so, there's, um, it changes occupancy type under the building code. And that would relate to how many fire exits they have to have or whether the building has to be sprinklered or not. And those are all building code requirements. They don't play into this planning or land use process. But if an occupancy changes from, and I'm gonna just make one up, say it's C1 versus going to a C2 occupancy type, then that could also trigger the MBS process. This one also has to do with reconfiguring or relocating an existing driveway. So that could also trigger the MBS. So again, that's some of the applicability standards behind the MBS. Let's see, I don't see any questions. I'm gonna just keep going. Um, submittal standards. So these are different from the requirements, as I mentioned, for site plan review, these are kind of a simplified version of the submittal standards from what's required for a site plan. We still want to see an existing conditions plan. Um, then the proposed plan. So we want to know what's there today and then what you're proposing to change, if anything. So this would include any new stuff or changed things. Also utility plan. So again, it's a lot of the similar type of things. It's just a simplified version of what's required to be uh, submitted. This has to do with the actual process. So this is where it talks about this type one ministerial review process without notice or our opportunity to appeal. If we looked back at, um, the site plan review section, we could find where it probably references a type two process. Um, the other thing I'll mention here is a lot of kind of an overriding theme within a lot of the code update is really taking discretion away from the city. 
And when I say the city, it really boils down to the director. The code refers to the director, and that's a defined term in the definition section. Um, the, you know, the director of our department can delegate the authority to the planning manager or you know, staff, the planners themselves to write these decisions, but it boils down to the discretion of the director. So a lot of the code is actually taking away the discretion from the director and, and making it more clear. Here's the rules that the city has to play by. And, and not only the city, but here's, the, everybody knows going into use the code, here's the rules a developer has to follow and here's the rules the city has to um, follow in approving a development. And I point that out because here, this section of the code, it gives the applicant the option to request that the application be processed to include public notice. If we were to look at the existing code, um, and I, I could find the citation probably, but it basically, I believe the existing code says something along the lines of the director can choose to elevate an MDS to a type two process. So, and it doesn't establish any standards for what the director considers in making that um, elevated application type. So um, again, if an applicant for some reason doesn't want the risk um, of somebody appealing, trying to argue that the city did use discretion and therefore it was a land use decision under state law, um, they could choose to ask us to pay notice and they would be required to pay a fee for us to do that. But it, it wouldn't be the director that has the discretion to elevate that application to a type two application. But that's a pretty common theme throughout a lot of these, um, the code revisions is that a lot of the discretion of the director themselves is taken away um, to make it just more clear and straightforward what's required. So back to the approval standards themselves. So we went through the submittal standards. Uh, once it's submitted, then it's reviewed based on the approval standards. And again, so this is where the clear and objective part comes into play. Um, this is again, kind of a, um, simplified version from the approval standards of the site plan review. So instead of referring to a lot of those other sections for landscaping and fencing um, and different things, I'm looking here to see what others, we try and be more specific and more clear, have these be clear and objective standards um, to highlight the areas that are kind of the things we're looking for under the MDS. So a lot of it has to do, like I mentioned, bike parking, the garbage area where um, trash enclosures are required. The trash enclosure often comes into play because under our um, stormwater management requirements, the city you know, is looking for the like rain falling on a garbage can to not leak dirty water from going through garbage into waterways and things like that. So trash areas are required to be covered and then any runoff from it be piped to the sanitary sewer instead of going into the stormwater system. So that's kind of this waste storage is an area we always look at. Landscaping, um, outdoor storage, here's the bicycle parking, also motor vehicle parking. This talks about the stormwater plan so again, we still do in some cases refer to other sections of the code, but not in all cases. It's kind of, again, it's a more simplified, straightforward version to be able to answer these questions, yes or no, they meet this or they don't. Um, I'll just point out that one of these <clears throat> is an area that Commissioner Cravula um, brought to question and let's make sure I can find it. Again, I don't have the PDF page numbers. Commissioner Cravula, if you have the page number here, um, 
it's BI, 3BI. So it's under this standard here that Commissioner Cravula had a question and it's actually 3BI. So it's here, he's asking about this fencing standard. I think your comment in general, Commissioner Cravula is- Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I can explain it. Yeah, sure. if it says if there's not the adequate area for uh, landscaping in front of the property, that it sounds like you can, the fault one of the following must be provided, which is basically placing a screening fence across the front. My point uh, in my comment was, is that landscaping is not just a screening uh, item, that landscaping performs a lot of other functions that uh, screening, uh, a fence screening would not uh, perform. So that was my comment on that. Okay. Yeah, and, and again, I referenced this earlier. I think that's a great comment. So it's again, it's this kind of balancing act and trying to improve the site to be more in conformance with what's something that was brand new that was developed that might be required versus what's possible on an existing improved site. So um, you're right, this is saying that where there's not a four foot wide area between the existing improvements in the front property line, for the landscaping required above up here, which requires a four foot wide landscape area, um, that if if that area is not available, then there's some alternatives. And again, so this is this is a way to provide clear and objective standards, but also provide flexibility, which is something we've heard from the council is um, important. Is to you know we could establish a standard and say. The clean and objective standard is you have to have this four foot landscape area. And then if you don't, then tough, you have to be um, redevelop the entire site or you can't change the use or you know whatever, you can't reuse the site. But in terms of trying to be flexible um, and make them rip out a bunch of parking and then have to maybe reconfigure their parking or not have enough parking for the size of building that's on the site based on the use and all these other things. It's kind of a trickle down impact. The alternative is there's potential for some alternatives. And one of those is this fence. And it sounds like um, you don't think this is a good idea. It may be that there's opportunity to add to this to saying if there, you know, again, maybe it's only two feet and Two feet's really not 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 enough to plant um, plant landscaping in and have it be viable, um, but there might be a way to say if you're less than the four feet, you have to provide fencing and um, a certain level of landscaping. You might not be able to landscape it to these standards, but you might be able to offset providing the landscaping to this standard to providing yeah. to providing the fence and some level of landscaping that can fit within the area. That's yeah, that kind of what this is talking about. This is an or here. So it might not be an or, it might be do the fencing and whatever level of landscaping that can be required. Yeah, I was also, you know, saying that, you know, they could perhaps plant in other areas if there wasn't sufficient area in the front. And then in uh, if all is said and done, um, they could, uh, provide a payment for off-site site tree, street trees or other plantings in lieu of on-site planting, sort of a mitigation bank kind mm. of an idea. So mm -hmm. that, um, you know, you, you, you got, you know, we, we're saying that we do want landscaping. If it's not on-site, if they can't get it on-site, maybe they can provide it somewhere else. Yeah, and those are great comments and things we can think about as we're trying to, you know, balance all these interests and other community comments and things like that that we'll hear. So yeah, those are the kind of things um, that are important, I think, to include. Any other thoughts or comments? And we're going to get close to running out of time here. It looks like we have about 15 more minutes, so I'll try and wrap up. Um, let's see what page we're on page five of eight 
So I might be able to get through this MDS process. And again, we can come back to this or revisit it. I know a, a few of the commissioners aren't here tonight. So as we move forward at our next meeting, and I'll probably jump to the procedure section at the next meeting. And again, we can refer back and forth to the definition section, or I can go through the definition section and kind of highlight what's new or changed compared to what's existing. Um, so we'll go through those additional sections, but to the extent there's additional thoughts, things come up that people thought about on these sections, we can um, definitely come back to them or revisit them. Um, Sure. I think that's the all the big comments you had on this section, Commissioner Cravula, unless I'm missing something. Uh, as I said, I did send you that email, and that's got right. a lot of both large and small uh, comments. So um, yeah. I think uh, so. I, I I'm totally comfortable with you looking at them uh, at your leisure. Okay. Yeah, and I'll just mention one of the small ones. I think you're referencing right here you ask for these drought resistant plantings. Um, you ask, um, do the plantings require warranties? And the short answer is no. Um, what we do is as a condition of approval or it's an ongoing condition is that the code specifies that a property owner must maintain the landscaping. So actually we were just talking about this in a code enforcement meeting today is like, at what point, you know, if if plants die, then we, you know, our code enforcement or our planning department sends a letter to the property owner saying, you know, we noticed that the plants died, they're required to be maintained and they need to be replaced, you know, that kind of thing. And if they don't, then we pursue compliance, you know, to enforce those ongoing conditions of approval that they maintain the landscaping. Um, again, these are still the appro approval standards. Again, we do refer still in some cases to different sections of code, but some of these approval standards um, are kind of a subset of the site plan approval standards. This kind of talks about the final approval. Um, this does talk about bonding or insurances for improvements. That's really to develop the site initially. It's not necessarily an ongoing bond to maintain the improvements. And I'm not sure this stuff's kind of just um, more legalistic and process type stuff. So that's kind of the MDS section. Any other thoughts or questions on the MDS process. Not seeing any. Hopefully I haven't all bored you to tears or put you to sleep, but um, I know this can be kind of dry stuff. Again, you're gonna have multiple opportunities to revisit this. You'll hear public comments ultimately on the at the public hearing stage. So there may be things that get highlighted that weren't thought of and we can revisit um, again, this is just an initial introduction to this material and a familiarization so that um, you can start to wrap your head around the scope of all what's going to be considered in more detail later. I think with that, um, I don't want to necessarily jump into another section just with about 10 minutes left. So maybe you can get a few minute break before the seven o'clock regular session starts. I did want to mention just as an FYI that. I'll be presenting to the Springfield City Club tomorrow at the noon hour meeting. It's a virtual meeting. If any of you have access to the City Club, um, I will be presenting on the code update process and the launch of the community engagement steps that we're in the midst of right now. Um, but with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or have any other comments or anything else. I see Commissioner Craver, do you still have your hand up? Yes, um, uh, a couple of couple of comments I'd like to make. Um, one of them is uh, talking about the homeowners association mm. in regards to the covenants con uh, and conditions uh, regarding middle housing and other types of low income housing. Now, to my thinking, this begins to create a serious issue with equity and how we're applying our standards. I'm not sure what can be done and what is needed. 
but I think that that should be a big part of the community engagement subject uh, so that people are aware that these state laws apparently do not apply to certain areas. Now, I actually kind of think of that as almost a 21st century redlining or a comparable that says, you know, we, we are not in our neighborhood, we are not gonna have low income housing. And in our neighborhood, we are not going to have duplexes, triplexes and fourplexes. And I, like I said, I think that that's an equity problem. And I, I think that that would, would be a real good um, uh, subject of discussion. Another thing I'd like to point out to the commissioners is uh, where in the code where it talks about development agreements, um, that are made between the between the city council and um, private developers, and it's a real interesting part of the code. And for those of us who are looking at some of the big changes that are perhaps happening in Springfield, for instance, the uh, downtown Buick site and the big developments proposed in Glenwoods, it's a real interesting part of the code. And I think that just if people want to read through that, I, I think it would be. Uh, just uh, very educational and uh, um, really germane to some of the stuff that's probably going to happen here real recently. So that's my final comments. Thanks, Mark. I can stop the um, recording if you guys want to take a break and be back by seven. Is that okay with you, Commissioner Landon? There you go. Yeah, should we officially adjourn the work session then? Yep. Work session is officially adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Business from the audience, which is a time for anyone to speak to the uh, to the Planning Commission on any subject that is not the Metro Plan Diagram Amendment or Zoning Map, map Amendment that is on the, the agenda tonight. If you are joining us online and wish to speak, please use the chat window. Please send a comment to the host with your name, mailing address, and the subject you would like to speak about. You can select the host only at the bottom of the chat window. Please do not use the chat feature for any other purpose during the meeting. I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. For people calling in by phone, we will announce a time for those on the phone to speak. If you do not wish to speak, just state that you do not want to speak. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? There's been no adjustments to the agenda. We will now take business from the audience. Do we have anybody from the audience? I have no messages or phone calls for anyone that wants to bring up any business. Okay, so our next item is approval of the minutes from 15 June. Are there any corrections to the minutes or do we have a motion to approve the minutes as published in the agenda packet? Yes, Chair, I have a, um, an amendment. Please proceed. Yeah, so um, two amendments, one for the um, work session and one for the regular session. For the work session, I had mentioned as a potential conflict of interest that I work for a housing developer, um, so I, would like to see that reflected in the meeting minutes. And for the work session, I do recall that the proposed tenant, or for the, the regular session, I mean, I do recall that the proposed tenant provided um, testimony in favor uh, over the phone. So I'd like to see that um, reflected as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other corrections or adjustments? I'd like to make a motion that we approve the minutes of June 15th as amended. All in favor? Need a second. Uh, my apologies, thank you. I second the motion. Second. 
Salazar. Okay, appropriate to call for a vote now. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, looks like we're unanimous. Thank you. Uh, so we'll call for agenda item. This is a time for uh, where, when we'll talk about the uh, proposed Metro Plan Diagram Amendment and Zoning Map. Um, I believe we turn this, at the beginning of this uh, public hearing was held on the 15th. We turn this over to the city attorney for uh, ex parte uh, contacts, conflicts. Thank you, Vice Chair. The role of the Planning Commission is to conduct a public hearing and make decision about decisions about land use matters in Springfield. The public hearing was conducted um, previously by the Commission, so your role tonight is to make a decision. Members of the Planning Commission are to be unbiased. Before the start um, of your deliberations, members of the Planning Commission must state whether they have any conflicts of interest, such as family, financial, or business relationships with any of the applicants or with regard to the land in question. If such a potential conflict exists or if an actual conflict exists, the commissioner will state whether, um, sorry, the commission, commissioners will state whether they have actual or potential conflicts. Um, and if it is an actual conflict, he or she must step down from the planning commission during the case. Planning commissioners must also state whether they have discussed the application in question with any of the parties or have independent knowledge of any relevant facts, such as from a site visit um, to the property uh, in question. If any of the planning commissioners have had such contacts and haven't disclosed them previously, then you must disclose the substance of that contact tonight. Or if you have any independent knowledge of relevant facts, you must summarize those facts if you have not done so previously. And Vice Chair, it's now appropriate for the commission to declare any um, potential or actual conflicts of interest, independent knowledge of relevant facts or ex parte contacts. Okay, I do not have any potential or actual conflicts of interest. Uh, Commissioner Bergen? Potential conflict of interest being a licensed real, real estate broker in Oregon and no ex parte contact. Commissioner Salazar? No potential conflicts of interest. And as I mentioned previously, I am familiar with the site through watching previous planning commission meetings and having driven past the property. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Koivala? Uh, no conflict of interest, uh, no uh, knowledge that others do not have about the site, and no ex parte contact. Okay, and by the way, I also have not had any ex parte contacts. I did not mention that. Um, so I believe that at this point, um, Christina, do you have anything that you say at this point? Okay. Uh, no, once you've done the, the process, then you can get started with your deliberations. I don't know if Andy wants to present any information on the updated staff report, but that would be the that would be the next step. And then after that, your deliberations. Since the public hearing is closed, there's really no additional information to be provided unless you take steps to reopen the record or, or hearing, but um, Andy can get background on the changes that were made based on the record as it stands. Okay. Turn sure, I'm happy to summarize, Mr. Vice Chair, if you'd like me to. Please do. Okay. Um, at the, the public hearing meeting on June 15th, staff had presented some comments that were sent by email um, in opposition to the proposed Metro Plan Amendment and zone change. They arrived late and were not able to be incorporated into the staff response uh, in the staff report. Um, staff had presented them to the commissioners for their consideration and, elect and recommended to the commission that the staff report could be amended to provide a staff response to the issues raised by uh, the respondents. In this case, primarily traffic and impacts to residential neighborhoods to the east of the site. Uh, so staff did add findings to both staff reports uh, that you have before you this evening, outlining 
the transportation and anticipated site access considerations for this property. There is a fixed established commercial site access for the existing commercial property uh, that's already zoned commercial off of Marcola Road. It's roughly 400 feet west of the intersection of the 28th Street and it is commemorated with an access easement. Uh, it, there is, it's almost the location where there is an existing driveway that's currently being used uh, for construction access and had previously been used for access to a shop building which has been demolished at least 10 years ago, I think. So it is appropriately separated from the busy intersection of Marcola Road and 28th Street. There is no provision for access from 28th Street being that it's on a curve. And so there is no anticipated commercial traffic that would impact residential areas on 31st Street especially to the north and east of this site uh, because all of the con commercial traffic would be associated with the driveway. Um, I'll say virtually all. It is possible that someone could, could exit circuitously through future development to the, to the north, but uh, the primary access and egress to the site will be from Marcola Road. Being that it's an existing um, commercial and industrial street at that location, um, staff had noted that it, there's not going to be an appreciable change in the traffic patterns um, with rezoning of this site to commercial um, and therefore felt that um, it is appropriate for the commissioners to take the comments into consideration and then proceed to deliberations. So if you have any, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. The, the applicant's also here to answer any questions. They've already made their presentation. We've already received the testimony and the record is closed. But I did want to point the commissioners to um, the amendments that have been made since the last staff report presented to you at the public hearing in June. Okay, any discussion of the application uh, or are we ready for a motion? Uh, I'd, I'd like to weigh in. Um, I did want to say that I read through the response to the um, uh, additional testimony and uh, understand it. And I, I'm ready to move ahead with the process. Okay. Other discussion or proposed motion? Commissioner Landon, I, I have my virtual hand raised, if I may. Oh, thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. I do want to uh, bring attention to uh, statewide planning goal 10. I know that we've talked about it um, in the report um, about moving from um, potentially the medium density residential over to a commercially uh, community commercial zone. Um, though it wouldn't take away a substantial amount from um, what is called the, sorry, I'm searching for it now, for the exact words that we're calling it. Um, of the surplus of MDR designation, um, I, in the midst of a housing crisis, um, I really wanna caution though, Though we know there are other um, abilities in MDR other than um, a residential home to be built in that um, allowable um, opportunities, we have to focus on not what is the potential to be built there, but what is the best use for this land. And as I was alluding to earlier, um, in the midst of a housing crisis, I'm not sure that eliminating more potentially um, more land that is very desirable in the building world right now um, to be removed from the potential for housing to a potential of um, to a, a zoning that doesn't allow for housing at all. And so I really want to focus on housing goal or statewide goal 10 um, because that is really important. And though we will be in a need for um, the medical facility that was presented to us in the future, this is a need right now. And so this is something that I think we really would be remiss if we didn't pay really close attention to. Uh, 
other comment? Uh, or proposed uh, motion. It's a little bit of a tough one. Um, Would it be helpful to the commission if I put the text of the motion and the vice chair script for tonight into the chat? Sure, sure. Um, this is just a proposed motion. So uh, if a member of the commission wants to make this motion, you can. If you want to modify the staff report or, or the um, proposed order, you can certainly do that as well. So again, this is a, a motion on the Metro Plan Diagram Amendment. And then I have posted a, the second motion on the zoning map amendment. That's for your reference and, and use however you see fit. I'd like to make a motion. I move to adopt the order and recommendation for the Metro Plan Diagram Amendment that is the agenda packet as attachment, as attachment number seven for this item. Second. Can I do this? Can I do the second? I'll second if you can. Okay, thank nice you. Uh, all in favor? Um, can we just go through the names? Commissioner, uh, go ahead, please. Commissioner Landon. Uh, aye. Commissioner Bergen. Nay. Commissioner Corvula. Yes. Commissioner Salzar. Aye. Okay, three, one. I'd like to make a second motion. I move to adopt the order and recommendation for the zoning map amendment that is in the agenda packet as attachment scrolling eight for this item. I will second. Commissioner Landon. Aye. Commissioner Bergen. Nay. Commissioner Coivula. Yes. Commissioner Salzar. Aye. OK, 3-1. OK, motion passes. Um, do we have any reports of city council meetings? I do have a question on that, if I may. Um, Commissioner Landon, we had, um, this is for staff. We had asked um, a couple months ago if we could get the list on um, whether it was the, our springfieldorgonspeaks.org or um, our website, our schedule. Um, were we able to get that? I haven't been able to find it and I'm sure it's just, I'm looking in the wrong spot. Well, I haven't been able to find it either, but that may or may not mean anything. Uh, Brenda? Sandy, do you want to take this? Sure. Good evening, commissioners. So we have talked with um, People Speak who powers our Springfield Oregon Speaks and made that request, but they haven't done it yet. So I will follow up um, and try to get a timeline to share with you at your next meeting as to when you can have that. But they have agreed to make sort of a page for the commission that you can look at that would include uh, a calendar or listing of those council meetings with your assignments and some of the other information you talked about. So I should be able to have some more information at your next meeting. Thank you. I'm sure I've missed some of my um, scheduled ones. So I appreciate that. And then uh, my next question, which I'm not because actually that I have a question that I'll save for the next segment. Thank you. 
Would it be helpful if I re send that out by email to everyone? I would be grateful for that. Okay. Please do. I can. I can. All right. Thank you, Brandon. You bet. Okay. Um, any other minutes to report? Uh, do we have any business from members of the Planning Commission? Yes, I, I'd like to make a comment. Um, I, I probably should have made it during the discussion for the uh, Arcola Meadows project, but um, although, although I do certainly understand Commissioner Bergen's discussion of needed housing, um, this is uh, air, uh, the Marcola Meadows when we did the uh, rezone on it, which uh, passed pretty clearly, uh, lost a lot of commercial space uh, when, we, when we got rid of the uh, live work arrangements that were there. So this is a, a, an opportunity to bring a new business to uh, the Marcola Meadows site. And um, they're also, you know, uh, a loss of needed housing is regretful. I still think, um, I think being that Springfield wants to be open for business that we really ought to welcome uh, Dr. Ambadi and his Pacific Clear Vision Institute to the city of Springfield and wish him great success in his new location. Thank you. Agreed, thank you. Um, Can I add on to that, Commissioner Landon? Please. Chair. Thank you for that perspective, um, Commissioner Cuevla. I appreciate that, and you are you're right. That'll that'll be a great opportunity. Thank you. Do we have any business from the Development and Public Works Department? Uh, good evening again. So uh, we do have a new commissioner, although he was unable to join you tonight, he should be joining you at your next meeting. So Brenda has given him an orientation and Mark has given him a briefing on the development code update. We haven't done the, the more generalized training with him yet, um, but we will be doing that. And so he will be joining you at your next meeting, uh, which is on July 20th. Um, I am going to be able to attend the beginning of that meeting, but we'll be taking a red eye that night to go on vacation and so may not be able to stay with you to the end. And I believe that Christina Kraz will also be on vacation. So Mary Bridget uh, Smith will be sitting in as the city attorney for your next meeting. There is a regular session following the work session. So during your regular session, there is a public hearing. Um, so it will be, um, and, and we do expect public comment that evening. So it will be a little bit longer of a meeting than maybe you're accustomed to. So I'm just giving you fair warning. Um, and the agenda item for the public hearing is already posted on Springfield, Oregon Speak. So you can get a preview at the application materials um, mm -hmm. if you're wanting to get familiar with that item in advance. And of course, as um, Mark shared with you earlier, um, you already, in a sense, have the pocket for the development code. You'll continue to review the code that was in the pocket for um, your meeting tonight. Yes, uh, Commissioner Bergen. Thank you. Will that meeting be virtual still, or do we have a plan to move in person again? Yes, it will be virtual still. Um, we have brought all of the staff back to the development center. So all of the staff that support the building permits, business licenses, land use applications, and code enforcement, and all of that in the Southeast quad of City Hall are working here from City Hall now, and we're open four days a week. Um, but we have not yet gone to in-person public meetings. I'm not sure if we'll be able to do that in August or um, if not August, for sure, September. And when we do, we will have some sort of a hybrid option so that people can still comment remotely. Um, so if they want, instead of coming in person to City Hall, there will be an option for them to either call in or log in and provide comment in some manner. So, um, 
we'll have to work out those details on how that's going to work. Um, and we need to practice. We do have some improvements to the city council chambers with cameras and microphones. So the technology is much improved thanks to funding from the CARES Act. So um, we have technology to be able to do more of the hybrid setup type meetings. Um, so if we don't get it all figured out in August, we will for sure be in person in September. Commissioner Quavola. Uh, yes, I did a quick uh, navigation to Springfield, Oregon Speaks. And um, is there a chance that we can get a full packet um, for this uh, July 20th meeting? It looks as if it's all bifurcated into like five or six different segments again. So we- Unless I'm not seeing it. No. We haven't put the packet together. Um, for that, we, there is no staff report prepared that's been posted yet. So like if, um, I think you can see my screen if you follow along. Yes. The item is here is the Willamette Lane Neighborhood Park and Bike Park. So what, what is here now is um, the documents that are available for the public. We've already sent the public notice out. So if people receiving that notice want to look at these items, these are available for them. Once um, we get the staff report finished, that will be posted here as well, uh, along with the other agenda items. And then there will be the full packet created like there is for the other meetings. So if I go like to tonight's meeting on this one, here um, you have the full packet available to you. And then each um, item has its set of um, agenda item summary and attachments but the full packet is available there. So we don't put the full packet together until all the items are posted to the meeting. Great, great. Thank you very much, Sandy, I understood. Okay. Okay, um, definitely appreciate that. Yeah, and just as a follow-up, I mean, once everything is posted, Brenda sends her email out. So, um, you can always come, like I said, you know, you can come and look at what's here for the meeting on the 20th. Um, but until you've gotten a meeting from Brenda, you, you won't have everything here. Although I see that there is already one comment. So like, here's that number one, and then I can go over here to comments and feedback. And then here is um, one of the comments that's been received. So if you probably can't see this given the view, but at the bottom it says zero of seven planning commissioners have viewed this comment. So once you've gone to log in to the site, um, it will, and then you've read that comment, it will show this number will change. However, many of you have come in and read that comment on this um, application. Oh, nice. Uh, so there's a place for comments and then also ask city staff. So if people send in a question and the, then in this case, Melissa would answer. Okay. Um, if we don't have any uh, further business, uh, I adjourn the uh, planning commission meeting. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you and nice job, Commissioner Landon. Thanks for your patience. Good night, all. Mr. Landon, can you wait a second? Yes.